Welcome, Hudson Valley, to this week's edition of In Touch, the award-winning public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. This week's guest is David Chernak, president of the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association. David and I talk about their upcoming shows for the 2023-2024 season. We also discuss their educational programs, jam sessions, and some of the history behind bluegrass music. We invite you to join us and listen to a previously recorded conversation between David and myself here on In Touch. Thank you for all the kind words shared in regard to In Touch officially being awarded the 2023 New York State Broadcasters Association Award for Outstanding Public Affairs Programmer Series as part of the 57th Annual Excellence in Broadcasting Awards. This recognition would not be possible without the incredible team here at Town Square, all of our phenomenal guests that we learn and grow with every single week, and of course you, the listener. Whether you've been listening for a while or you just found us, thank you for taking part in the conversation and staying in touch with what's going on in the Hudson Valley. We here at In Touch are all about, well, being in touch with what's going on in the Hudson Valley. What better way to stay in touch with what's going on than by downloading the Town Square Media mobile app for this radio station. Not only can you listen to this station live at any time using the app, but you can also listen to In Touch On Demand. Besides In Touch, you can read daily articles about news, events, entertainment, and more that's going on in your community. And when the weather gets bad, you can use the app to check on weather reports and see which roads, schools, and organizations are closed. Your Town Square media app is the best place for concert tickets and events as well. We're constantly giving away tickets to the hottest shows in the area. Again, you'll have access to all of this if you just download the Town Square media mobile app for this radio station. In Touch is nothing without the support of the hundreds of listeners that we get on a weekly basis. Thank you so much for listening and taking part in the conversation. If you listen to In Touch through a podcast service such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a positive review. With more five-star reviews on these platforms, the algorithms will work hard to promote our show and bring In Touch to new people. That and also sharing In Touch with your friends and family is so important. Just sharing our links and listening live each Sunday goes such a long way. Thank you for all you do to stay in touch with what's going on in the Hudson Valley. Hello, Hudson Valley. Thank you for listening to another episode of In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's award-winning public affairs and issues program. We have a phenomenal returning guest with us here today, president of the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association, David Chernak. David was with us earlier in the year as they are wrapping up their 2022-2023 season, but now they are just about to begin their 2023-2024 season. They have a lot of awesome programs going on, some that are continuing on, some brand new events, and also some really great educational and outreach programs that I'm really excited to get into talking about today. So let's welcome him here. David, how are you? Super great. Thanks for the introduction, Connor. It's great to see you again. Great to be back. Yeah, excited to talk about some more bluegrass with you in the Hudson Valley. Absolutely. It is no secret that I love getting musicians or music related guests here on the show because, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's what I went to school for. That's my passion for. So I love getting to talk shop, talk music and talk about how it affects the community. And I love it. Now, for somebody who may have missed that previous episode, I don't know why they would want to do that. But in case they missed that previous episode or just unfamiliar with the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association. Could you give us a little bit of an overview? Absolutely, yeah. So the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association, or HBBA for short, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's been around for about 20 years in the Hudson Valley. And our mission is to uh, spread the word about bluegrass music in the Hudson Valley and provide a venue for both regional acts, who are our members and and great local bluegrass musicians, as well as national acts to come in and uh, play bluegrass music and and bring this music to uh, as many ears as possible in our region. We do that by doing outreach work to uh, local schools and organizations, playing music at fairs and having a house band who who goes around and and plays music, uh, bluegrass music, wherever it's requested. And we also do that by having those concerts. And we just started our uh, 2023-2024 concert season last month. And we've got uh, a whole great lineup of concerts going all the way through May of next year. So we're super excited about all the bluegrass music that we're going to be bringing in in the next year. That's terrific. And for those who may be uninitiated to bluegrass music, how would you exactly describe the sound and some of the roots that the music has? 
Yeah, absolutely. Bluegrass music gets its name from one of the first, or in fact, the first, depending on who you ask, uh, bluegrass bands, which was started by a mandolin player. Uh, mandolin a, is probably an, an instrument that a few folks are unfamiliar with. I just have one right here at my side, as I always do. It's a, it's an instrument with uh, eight strings that are in courses of two that are tuned the same, G, D, A, E. Tuned the same as a fiddle or violin, um, but it's played with a, a flat pick like this. One of the you know first real bluegrass musicians was a mandolin player named Bill Monroe. He was from Kentucky, and his band was called the Bluegrass Boys. You know, obviously the, the Bluegrass State. And since he was sort of the progenitor of the music, you know, it was it was named for for him and his band. Bluegrass music usually has five or six main instruments in it. You've got a, a mandolin. The banjo is probably the the sound that most people associate the most closely with bluegrass music. You've got a fiddle, a guitar, a bass guitar, and then occasionally uh, you'll have a resonator guitar or a dobro guitar, mm -hmm. which is a, a very interesting instrument that has a, a metal cone to it. It's shaped like a, t a guitar, but rather than being played like this vertically, you, you flip it like this and you play it with finger picks and you've got yep. a slide and it's got that sort of twangy sound that's familiar to a lot of country music fans who like steel guitar and pedal steel and that sort of thing. Very beautiful. Um, but that's the yeah, that's the idea of bluegrass, and it's it's a relatively young genre. You know, Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys only formed in the late 1940s, but it's a completely American genre, of course, now that has sort of international appeal, and there's bluegrass bands all over the world. And, of course, right here in the Hudson Valley, you know, there's a lot of great bluegrass bands here and bluegrass heritage here with folks like uh, Levon Helm, a great mandolin player who settled in the Hudson Valley, uh, Pete Seeger, um, mm. and a lot of other great bluegrass musicians who either called the Hudson Valley home at some point or, or made it their base of operations while they uh, played this music. Absolutely. One thing about bluegrass music, I'd really like to hear your take on it. I feel like with the recent folk emergence that has been going on recently, I feel like there's been a lot more appreciation for bluegrass coming out as that as well, because though folk and bluegrass are the exact genre, there are a lot of similarities and a lot of things go hand in hand. And a lot of times you'll see bluegrass artists play folk songs and folk songs play folk artists play bluegrass music. And I feel like they kind of work together. Now, if I'm not mistaken, like bluegrass has a lot of its uh, roots in like old uh, European folk music and kind of stemmed from that and Americanized and turned into its own thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially uh, especially some of the, the fiddle traditions. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of what uh, bluegrass musicians will play together when they're like at a jam. You know, the, you bring around a bunch of chairs and you sit in a circle and, and play things together. You know, there's this common repertoire of, of things that I'll, you know, most bluegrass musicians will know is will say, oh, let's play Cherokee Shuffle or let's play Big Sciota, you know, these these few dozen fiddle tunes that everybody knows. And that fiddle tune tradition is brought a lot from the sort of Scotch-Irish tradition of, you know, folks who emigrated and uh, settled in the Appalachian region. And, you know, that's sort of the, you know, the sort of the home base and, and spiritual home of bluegrass. And you can, you know, draw that route directly uh, to those European traditions. You can also draw the link between a lot of the African and jazz traditions. You know, mm. the, the banjo was an instrument that was invented sometime in the last 700 years in um, in Africa and was brought over oh, wow. uh, with, with slaves who eventually were freed and, and um, you know, started their own musical traditions that became jazz and that influenced bluegrass as well you know you know jazz is the the true you know american musical art form and, and bluegrass came right after it and i don't think bluegrass would exist without um you know the banjos sort of rise to prominence in a lot of other genres in the united states in the uh in the 1920s and and then onto the sort of uh, bluegrass music tradition forming more coherently in the 1940s that's incredible. I had no idea about that with the banjo. So thank you for sharing that. See, I'm learning something new every day. And it's like, where was that in my four years of music college? But no, that's terrific. I'm really happy to hear about that. So glad that we were able to talk about some of the history and give a little background to it. Let's talk about what's going on today. You guys have your 2023-2024 season of music. And actually, the show that you have coming up in just a couple of days, um, it's going to be on October 20th in Poughkeepsie. See, you have the Deep River Ramblers, a tribute to John Prine. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying, the uh, mix and the synthesis between folk and bluegrass. Uh, John Prine, when I think of him, I think more folk. But again, kind of going back and forth like that. And it's a wonderful 
opportunity to be able to honor one of the greatest songwriters of like the 20th century in a way like this. So can you tell us a little bit about this upcoming show? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a really fantastic show that we're excited for. Of course, we lost John Prine early on in the COVID pandemic in 2020. Such a huge loss for all of American music. You know, his voice was so humorous and dry, yet still you know, rich and, and, you know, lyrically very, very rich and, and such a unique songwriter. And, you know, even though he wasn't a bluegrass musician himself, you know, a lot of his songs have sort of been adopted in the, in the bluegrass canon, like a lot of sort of, you know, North American folk singers, you know, some folks like Gordon Lightfoot, who we also yes. just lost a little bit earlier this year, great Canadian folk singer, you know, his, a lot of his songs are standards in the bluegrass world. So you see a lot of that and you see that crossover. So, you know, if, even though he was a folk musician, the loss of John Prime was a huge one for, uh, yeah. for the bluegrass world. And Chris Brashear and the Deep River Ramblers group that we had had in 2019, right before the pandemic, and they gave us a great show. And they're fantastic musicians who can really sort of very chameleon-like and, and can adapt and, and live in all these sort of sub-genres of folk and bluegrass to sort of best fit the, the material that they're working with. Uh, they're based out of uh, Central Massachusetts, and they're they're coming over to to play for us on uh, yeah on the on the twentieth. Really, really excited about that. And while we don't do pre-sale tickets, tickets for the for all of our shows are uh, available at the door. And we host our shows at the Unitarian Fellowship Church uh, in Poughkeepsie. It's at sixty seven South Randolph Avenue in Poughkeepsie. We've held our shows there for uh, the last couple of years, and it's a great intimate venue where we can really get up close and personal with these artists. And that's one of the great parts that, you know, that, that drew me into the organization when I went to their shows when I was, you know, uh, a kid was that you, know, you really get to be up close and personal with these artists, some of whom are, are completely world class. You know, we've had some really great acts over the years. It wasn't a show that I was able to go to, so unfortunately, but, you know, no. we've, we've had Tony Rice, We've had, um, you know, some real legends. We've had Byron Berline, um, you know, names who, you know, in, when said in, in a bluegrass crowd, you know, raise some eyebrows, you know, that the fact that we could have these folks, you know, on our stage and, you know, sitting 10 feet away from them and, and watching them make some of the best bluegrass music in the world, um, you know, just for our our audience in Poughkeepsie is, is absolutely incredible. And we'll be having more of the same for, for the rest of the season, but looking forward to, uh, to the Deep River Ramblers this weekend for sure. Absolutely. That's going to be such a great show. And I love the intimacy that your shows offer. You know, I feel like that's one of the best things about music. Sure, you can go to these big stadium shows. And trust me, there is a certain intimacy about that as well. But it, I, there's something so special about being able to connect with an artist right there on stage and the artist connecting back with you. This was something we were talking about with folks with uh, the Metal Ark Festival not too long ago, which I was, I was invited. I got to go. I was able to see several of the performers, and they were terrific. And it was just like one of those wonderful experiences of just an artist, their instrument, and the audience there. And it was mm -hmm. so beautiful. It was so beautiful. I think you would have really enjoyed it. The metal arc festival, uh, had a lot of, uh, folk, uh, jazz, bluegrass kind of stuff all in there. It's really, really good. I highly recommend it. But again, you're listening yeah. to in touch town square media, the Hudson Valley's award-winning public affairs and issues program. We're speaking with David Chernak, president of the Hudson Valley bluegrass association, really excited for their 2023, 2024 calendar year. Their next big show that's going to be happening is the deep river ramblers, a John Prine tribute. It's happening October 20th in Poughkeepsie, and we're really excited about that. But something else that really got me excited, we were talking about off the microphone, is that you guys do some really cool educational programs, especially during the beginning of the school year now. So I'm curious to learn what you do, because we talked about this last time. Both you and I, we got integrated into music early, and that's where our love for our genres and our instruments started. So I'm really interested in hearing what you were doing to now inspire the, mu the young musicians in the Hudson Valley today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so education and outreach is a huge part of, of what we do, and it's a huge part of our mission. You know, young students, especially young musicians, are folks who we want to make sure know about this uh, legacy and, and know that it's a type of music that is open and highly participatory. You know, I grew up as a classically trained, you know, violin and viola student, you know, in, in high school and everything. I came to bluegrass when I was around that age, and it was so different from 
every other type of of music that that I was a part of. You know, there's there's no sheet music, and you're sitting around, uh, you know, learning tunes by ear. You're sitting around with folks who are, you know, playing this common repertoire where you're speaking this musical language that everyone knows and everyone is on a level playing field with. And you know, you go to these bluegrass jams where you know everyone brings their instrument and you know regardless of, of skill level you know everyone's playing together and and everyone can make this music together you know without having to bring a book of music or, or even knowing how to read music or having to to read music in the first place so that's a, a big part for us um you know one thing that we have coming up just later this week is we're um going to be doing a uh, bluegrass informational for this wonderful uh group called the strawberry hill fiddlers mm. uh which is a group of young high school and middle school aged string players, you know, violin and cello and bass and viola players and teaching them about bluegrass. You know, we, we have this house band that sort of developed during the pandemic, you know, out of our HBBA members, and including myself. And we called ourselves the Blue Mask Boys, <laughs> a, a riff on the blue bluegrass boys of, of Bill Monroe. But also because when we were first doing those programs, we were wearing our, our blue masks and yep. just sort of fit. Um, <laughs> But we, we have this band that, you know, we each we each play one of the, the various instruments, as I was mentioning before. And we, you know, we go out to to these groups and, and a group like the Strawberry Hill Fiddlers, they're a, a group of sort of like I was. I actually went went through that program, you know, classically trained string students and teaching them about bluegrass. What are the stylistic things that make bluegrass bluegrass and, and teach them a song or a, or a fiddle tune or two to sort of get them familiar with it and, and see if that's something that they would like to do. And, you know, I went through a similar thing. Thing. And, you know, I sort of went down the, the wicked path of bluegrass away from classical music. And, and yep. here I am and I'm having a great time. And we've done similar things earlier in the year. We uh, we played for uh, the students at the Poughkeepsie Day School already this year. Nice. Um, so we've got um, lots more of that coming. And, and it's really important to us that bluegrass is in the schools and, and that it's a musical form that kids are familiar with. And it's one that, you know, bluegrass music, you know, a lot of people, you know, think of bluegrass musicians as you know, sitting on a porch in a rocking chair, playing the banjo, you know, maybe some older folks, but, you know, you go to a bluegrass festival and you're going to see a lot of people my age or younger who are uh, playing music and, and really ripping their instruments and just, you know, playing really well and really fast, you know, stuff that makes me want to go home and practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, bluegrass education in the schools is, is really huge for us. And uh, that's something we're going to continue to do through, uh, through the rest of the year and, uh, and next. That's awesome. So as somebody, you know, who was classically trained and that's how you're, you know, initiated into music, learning the violin, what was it necessarily for you? You said it was different than everything else that you were learning at the time. And for any other inspired musicians out there who might, I don't know, feel lost in their training as of right now, lost or maybe even restricted, Tell us about some of that freedom that you found with bluegrass. Sure, absolutely. You know, so so as a as a classical musician, you know, you're you're in ensembles where, of course, you're you're learning these pieces of music together, and you have a conductor, um, and those are still wonderful experiences. I still play that music a lot. Although, you know, what I found with bluegrass is that not only is learning music by ear, sort of in a communal setting extraordinarily fun and and freeing absolutely um, but it, it's also the the improvisation aspect of it you know a lot of times when you let's say you know you're, you're jamming with a, a couple of folks and you know you sing the verse to a song and then everyone comes in and sings the chorus together in harmony it's time for a solo so you know the guitar player will uh you know play the you know one of the forms you know either the verse or the chorus form depending on the song and be able to improvise and you know take the sort of main theme of that song or that tune and improvise around it and and play some things you know throw in some bluesy notes that's not something that you can really do in uh in classical music no not um, quite <laughs> and that, <laughs> that's something that i really in, enjoyed a lot was was being able to to take solos, to improvise, to to play around with things a little bit. And, you know, the more jams and the more performances, the more festivals you go to, you listen to how each, especially each professional musician, really has a voice in their instrument and, you know, the, the sort of motifs that they play with. A lot of times you'll hear them make homages to, you know, previous musicians and like, oh, they picked that element out of, you know, Tony Rice's album from 1978 that, you know, that last four measures and it's, there's so many layers to it and it's just 
the, the more you learn about bluegrass, the more you sort of discover um, and the more you sort of feel like you are a part of it. And that's another thing about bluegrass music is it's extraordinarily participatory. If you find one other person who likes bluegrass music, you're not going to be bored for the rest of the day. If you, they lock the <laughs> two of you in a room, you know, that you can, you can play with, with anybody and it's a common language that's spoken. And again, it's one that you don't necessarily need years and years of practice and prodigy to, to be a, a part of, you know, it's, it's very inclusive and it's something that just anyone can have fun with. If, if you sort of know a, a few basic chords and a few basic songs, then you're in. That's awesome, man. I agree when it comes to being able to improvise and listen by ear. It is an absolute skill to be able to read sheet music and something that I still work on to this day. I am forever a student of music. But, you know, I found that I've really built my chops through just some of those jams, through just working with other musicians, playing by ear, talking with each other. It's really a beautiful experience, regardless of the genre, just sitting down with a band and just being able to talk out a song, play it, and be like, hell yeah. So, no, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate all that. And I'm sure there's some musician out there that's going to really appreciate hearing what you just said. So one thing about coming all together, you said you have your house bands. You say that you travel out. But you also do have a resident place that you have these open jam sessions as well. Um, you do that at the Manor of Woodside, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So on the, the first and third Wednesdays of the month, we have our uh, our open jams at the Manor at Woodside. There, they've been so gracious to to host us, and it's a great place to to come and 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 learn how to pick. If you sort of are a guitar player or a violin player who hasn't necessarily made the transition to fiddle player yet or something like that, it's a great open environment to sort of you know hear a lot of the bluegrass standards. You know, sort of this the core 20 or so songs mm. uh, sort of form the, the core of that jam. And we also sponsor other jams. For example, we've got the Gardner Bluegrass Jam, uh, which is the, the Gardner Free Library uh, across the river in, in Ulster County, which is on fourth Wednesdays of the month. Um, so plenty of opportunities to, to come and uh, learn some bluegrass chops uh, at, a, at the jams that are hosted by the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association and our friends. That's terrific. I'm glad that you have that opportunity for people to be able to get involved. And, you know, it's it's simple. It's easy. It's lax. You just come in, enjoy and you learn. And that's beautiful. Again, you're listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's public affairs and issues program. We're sitting down with president of the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association, David Chernak. And we've been talking about the wonderful educational programs that they have for people of really all ages to get involved with bluegrass music. And I'm really excited about all the opportunities and all the really cool events, especially the Deep River Ramblers, a John Prine tribute that's happening in Poughkeepsie October 20th. All links and information for that can be found in the description of this episode, so you can look into that. But, David, where can people find more information on the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association? Yeah, you can definitely check out our website. That's uh, hbbluegrass.org, and that has links to uh, all of our events, recordings from previous concerts, uh, interviews like like this, uh, blogs and articles, and also a list of our member bands. Uh, we have bands that are members of the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association that are local acts that that perform uh, around the Hudson Valley. And if you're looking to, to see them or hire them for an event of yours, uh, we have a full list of them uh, on our website and so much more. We have, we have trivia, we have articles, uh, we have a list of our educational events, and we've got everything bluegrass and Hudson Valley related up on uh, our website at hbbluegrass.org. That's terrific. And I'm glad that you highlighted hiring musicians. Think local. Support local, y'all. Honestly, every musician that you listen to started out as a local artist. So whether these artists want to be the big time or they're just happy with hanging around and playing for you guys here in the Hudson Valley, support them. That is something beautiful, especially, you know, in the midst of everything that happened this summer with 
striking with writers and actors. And uh, trust me, if more musicians could unionize, they'd be doing the same thing, too. So just support the local arts. And I'm glad that you mentioned that. So definitely check them all out. David, thank you so much for being here on In Touch. Thank you for educating us. I definitely learned a few things I didn't know today. So really appreciate that. And make sure that you check out their event calendar, especially the Deep River Ramblers, John Prine tribute happening on the 20th. Again, David, thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much, Connor. Great to be back and talk about bluegrass with you. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Absolutely. This has been this week's edition of In Touch, the award-winning public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. We want to give a big thank you to David Chernak. For more information on the Hudson Valley Bluegrass Association, visit hvbluegrass.org. Of course, all links and information can be found in the description of this episode. Whether you've been listening for a while or you've just joined us, Thank you. You can find In Touch episodes new and old on your favorite streaming services like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. That and listen on demand with your Town Square radio station mobile app. Of course, you can still find all articles and audio under the In Touch tab on this radio station's app and website. And don't forget, we're also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at InTouch underscore HV. If you like what we do here on In Touch and want to be on the show, let us know. Whether you have a topic you want discussed or you want to be a guest, the best way to contact us is through our office number, 845-471-1500, or email direct to connor.walsh at townsquaremedia.com. I've been your host, Connor Walsh. Until next time, stay curious, keep an open mind, and as always, I'm glad we get to spend some time.